to add a bunch of, a number of thank yous to our greetings tonight. Um, I would like to thank Justice Sachs for having spent January and some February in Chicago with us where he has received a warm welcome, although not from the weather. I would like to thank Sarah Moberg, the administrator of the Human Rights Program, who has dealt with innumerable logistical questions related to this series and Justice Sachs. I'd like to thank Katie Turk, who's been his teaching assistant in this course. I would like to thank our colleagues from other institutions, particularly Jane Sachs, Columbia College, Bernadine Dorn from Northwestern University Law School, for helping to arrange other events for Justice Sachs when he was here. And I would like to now introduce the introducer of Justice Sachs. This evening, we are very pleased to welcome Jeffrey Stone. Jeffrey Stone has been a member of the faculty of the law school of this university since 1973. He has served as dean of the law school and as provost of the university. And I want to say that the human rights program owes a special debt to Professor Stone's leadership when he was provost is when he led and promoted the development of the human rights program in 1997. So in many ways, without, without Jeff Stone, we wouldn't be here today. Um, Professor Stone is one of the university's leading public intellectuals. He's the author of many articles and several books, including notably Perilous Times, Free Speech and Wartime, from the Sedition Act of 1798 to the War on Terrorism, which has received numerous national awards. He's also very engaged in the civic life of Chicago and the nation. He's on the National Board of Directors of the American Constitution Society, on the National Advisory Council of the American Civil Liberties Union, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the American Law Institute, a member of the Straight for Equality Project of Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, and a member of the board of the Chicago Children's Choir. Um, it is with great pleasure we, I introduce one of our foremost legal scholars and public intellectuals, Jeffrey Stone. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, you'll pardon me for reading much of my introduction because, as you'll see, it consists almost entirely of quotations of our speaker. And when you quote a justice of a constitutional court, you want to get it right. Uh, so I don't trust myself to try to paraphrase uh, these remarks. So in 2005, South Africa defined marriage as a union of one man and one woman. Um, in the Foree case, the South African Constitutional Court considered whether this definition of marriage uh, violated the provision of the South African Constitution, providing that the state may not unfairly discriminate against individuals on the basis of certain characteristics, which included, among others, race, religion, gender, and sexual orientation. So the question before the court was whether the failure to permit same-sex marriage constituted unfair discrimination in violation of the South African Constitution. Justice Albie Sachs wrote the opinion of the court in that case, and I'd like to read to you uh, some passages from that opinion. The ban on same-sex marriage, Justice Sachs wrote, represents a harsh if oblique statement by the law that same-sex couples are outsiders. It reinforces the wounding notion that they are to be treated as biological oddities, as failed or lapsed human beings who do not fit into normal society. The antiquity of a prejudice is no reason, he said, for its survival. Slavery lasted for a century and a half in this country, the prohibition of interracial marriages for even longer, and overt male domination for millennia. All were based on apparently self-evident biological and social facts. All were once sanctioned by religion and imposed by law. It is argued, he said, that to radically alter an institution of centuries-old significance to many religions would itself violate religious freedom. This argument he said, raises important issues concerning the relationship between the sacred and the secular. For millions in all walks of life, religion provides support and nurture and a framework for individual and social stability and growth. Religious belief is the capacity to awaken concepts of self-worth and human dignity, which form the cornerstone of human rights. Religious bodies play a large and important part in public life and command ethical behavior from their members. Religion is not just a question of personal belief or doctrine. 
It is rather part of a people's temper and culture. It would, Justice Sachs said, therefore be wrong and unhelpful to dismiss opposition to homosexuality on religious grounds simply as an expression of bigotry akin to racism. But it is one thing, he added, for the court to acknowledge the important role that religion plays in our public life, and quite another to use religious doctrine as a source for interpreting our Constitution. It would be out of order to employ the religious sentiments of the majority as a guide to the constitutional rights of others. The hallmark of an open and democratic society, he said, is its capacity to accommodate and to manage differences in intensely held worldviews in a reasonable and fair manner. The objective of the Constitution is to allow different concepts about the nature of human existence to inhabit the same public realm, and to do so in a manner that is not mutually destructive, and that at the same time enables government to function in a way that shows equal concern and respect for all. The right of same-sex couples to enjoy the same status, entitlements, and responsibilities as marriage law accords to heterosexual couples is, he said, in no way inconsistent with the rights of religious communities to continue to refuse to solemnize or celebrate same-sex marriage. The constitutional rights of same-sex couples can accordingly not be negated by invoking the rights of believers to have their religious freedom respected. The two sets of interests involved do not collide, but coexist in a constitutional realm based on accommodation of diversity. The court therefore held that the failure to permit same-sex marriage constituted unfair discrimination in violation of the South African Constitution. It's my pleasure to introduce Justice Albie Sachs, whose life as a young anti-apartheid pro protester, political prisoner, law professor, civil rights activist, political exile, freedom fighter, victim of state-sponsored terrorism, constitution framer, distinguished author, and renowned jurist, exemplifies the very meaning of the well-lived life. When asked what lessons others might draw from his personal struggles and experiences, Justice Sachs replied, don't be afraid to find the good in others, to listen to others, to try to understand their positions. There's a lot of power in putting yourself in the shoes of the other person. We can see that spirit of empathy throughout his landmark opinion in Foray. Pleased to introduce Justice Albie Sachs. It's pretty bad when I start applauding myself. <laughs> but I must say it was quite wonderful hearing those passages from, from the judgment. Uh, they were pretty good. <laughs> 1991. I'm driving. It's November and I'm sweating. November in Cape Town is the beginning of summer. And I'm sweating because I'm driving with my left hand for the first time. I'm sweating because I don't know the roads very well. I've been in exile for 24 years. And the people said, we'll meet at the usual meeting place. And I didn't even know where the usual meeting place was. I'm sweating above all because for the first time I'm going on a gay pride march. The sweat is pouring down my back. If only I say to myself, if only they could have a poster saying straights for gays. And then I feel ashamed for even thinking that. And I'm late. And I see the marchers coming in my direction and I have to find somewhere to park the car. And I get out of the car and the very first poster I see says, suck, don't swallow. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm in the newspapers tomorrow. <laughs> I was weaker then than I am now, and I sort of hobble along to catch up with the crowd. It wasn't very really big, maybe 200 people. And I join in next to Edwin Cameron, law professor, now member of the Constitutional Court. And I feel fantastic. And I feel proud. 
I felt that I had crossed over something, just connecting up in that simple way. And we march for a mile or two and we end up at Little Park. Those who know Cape Town well would know Deval Park, where I used to play as a child. And then signs went up saying whites only, and I thought there could have been signs saying straights only. We have a little meeting there, and I address the assembled crowd. Most of them are not very keen to hear a talk, especially from a straight guy. But I say that this march is important because it's claiming the rights of a significant sect, section of our population who've been heavily discriminated against. But I think it's important for a more profound reason in South Africa, because it deals with the right to be different. And we are a country of enormous difference, and difference was used in the past to elevate some and to keep the majority in subjection. Difference became a weapon of control and domination. And we've got to learn to handle difference. So through dealing with the rights of people whose sexual orientation was not that of the mainstream, we are learning to manage difference in our society. And it becomes almost a, a symbol and a signal of how well we can manage difference generally. It's constitutive of our whole new democratic nation. That was 1991. The story moves forward to 2005, I think it was. And we're having a meeting of the judges of the Constitutional Court, and Slanger, the Chief Justice, says, is there anybody who will be available in April during the court recess to speak on behalf of the court to a gathering called Christian Lawyers for Africa. They'd invited him to speak. He was going to be out of the country. Could someone else go? My hand goes up very tentatively. Well, Pius, I'm on recess duty. I'll be here. I don't think I'm the right person. He says, you're exactly the right person. Pius is Christian, lawyer from Africa. But he wouldn't want to go in that capacity because that would be a sectarian connection. If I go, I'm speaking on behalf of the institution, the court. So a few weeks later, I'm being driven this time. I'm not sweating. It's in the evening. And I'm thinking, what can I say? I don't want to just say, Welcome to our country, have a good conference. Uh, I bring you greetings from the Constitutional Court. These are people of conscience. Our court is dealing with rights of conscience all the time. There should be something more significant, something that tells them they're in the new South Africa now. And I think of what to say. And. What comes to mind, in fact, was something that I said at a conference organized by Brigham Young University, ironical in the way things have panned out in this country, that I should be speaking on this theme now. And when I'm called upon to speak, I say I want to share with the delegates here a problem I had when I was being sworn in as a judge of the Constitutional Court. And you could either affirm, in which case you simply put your hand forward and affirmed, or you could raise your right arm and say, so help me God. And I'm deciding what should I do. And ordinarily I would affirm. And I'm wondering what should I do. I was alphabetically challenged. 
So we had Truskelson, Reagan, Mohoro, Sachs. Afterwards, Van der Westhuizen came, Jakob came, so I wasn't at the end alphabetically, which meant I watched my colleagues. I think two or three affirmed, the others said, so help me God, and they used five different South African languages. And finally it comes to me. And I, I said to the delegates, uh, questions of conscience were profoundly important for me. In all half Jews, half Christians. I'm a Jew from a, a non-religious, very secular background. My parents fought against their parents over religion. And Mitzvah is approaching. If you want a Bar Mitzvah, we'll support you completely. The choice is yours. I'm 12 years old. And I'm thinking. And I think to myself, if I stand up there and I pretend a belief to God without it being an honest belief, I'm being disrespectful to myself and I'm being disrespectful to God if God exists. Looking back, it's quite heavy for a 12-year-old. <laughs> And I said, now I must decide what form the oath should take. And I said, the oath I wanted to take to the new constitution was the most solemn oath that I could imagine. It was to Ruth First, who had been killed by a letter bomb, to Lux Matsal Wandley, tortured to death, Joe Nabi, assassinated with a pistol. People I've been very, very close to, and I felt the way to honor them is with my right arm. And so I, in court, lifted my right arm and said, so help me God. I got a standing ovation I thought they might be a bit upset that I'm saying that in some ways it was an instrumental invocation for my own secular spiritual purposes. The next morning I took them on a tour of the Constitutional Court. It's a very beautiful building right in the heart of the old Fort Prison in Johannesburg. It lasted about an hour and a half. I want to leave because I have another meeting in the women's jail nearby and I'm already late. They say, please don't go, we want to say a prayer. If some prayers are a couple of sentences. Some prayers go around the world a few times <laughs> and this is one of those. <laughs> And I say, thank you very much. And I appreciate it. They were giving me what they had to give. That was their affection, their concern for me. So I didn't accept it as a prayer. I accepted it as a gift of prayer, which came from their hearts and reached my heart. And I'm about to rush off. And they say, no, we must lay on hands. <laughs> 70 pairs of hands takes a long time <laughs> and eventually I rush off to my meeting. Not long afterwards I'm asked by the Chief Justice to write the first judgment, that's the term we use, the first opinion, in the same-sex marriage case. And I tell you these two stories because in writing that judgment I wanted to write for the Gay Pride Marches and for the Christian Lawyers for Africa. It's a court for the whole nation. 
it's not for one section to win, the other section to lose. One section to feel included, the other section to feel excluded because of the nature of the opinion. The case came to us when two people who had met, been attracted to each other, started going out together, began to live together, were accepted by their friends as a couple, decided, let's get married. And they went to the marriage officer and he said, I personally have no objections, but you are both women, and the law says that I must say to you, do you, A, B, take C, D to be your lawful husband stroke wife? And those words just don't fit with two people of the same gender. Until the law is changed, I can't uh, preside over your union. They went to court. There were quite long technical proceedings. It ended up with two cases going side by side, and it came to the Constitutional Court. It was one of those cases where there was a lot of edge, but no overt rudeness. Uh, the person arguing on behalf of the women was in fact an elderly Afrikaans speaking man from the old God. But to him it was a simple story. Two people were in love with each other, they wanted to marry, the Constitution says no unfair discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation, the law must permit them to marry. He didn't go into philosophical things, right to equality, none of that historical stuff, uh, history of colonialism, slavery, uh, and so on. Somebody from the Equality Project, which had emerged out of the National Council of Gay and Lesbian uh, equality, which had brought cases earlier on, argued with rather more emotion. And then the arguments against some people sent by the a Catholic Cardinal, a Mr. Smythe, who'd been an advocate, a barrister in England, quoting directly from the Bible, speaking quite quite quietly and calmly and saying that really we believers have treated marriage as being heterosexual for centuries. That's how marriage has been constituted. That's what marriage is. He more or less indicated that we are not objecting to the regulating of partnerships for purposes of economic relationships, if it's a breakdown of the union and so on, but don't call it marriage. If you call it marriage, the implication was the very institution of marriage is somehow being undermined or uh, contaminated. He didn't use that language, but that was the, the gist of what he was saying. We reserved the judgment, the term that's used, and it was very clear early on that given the text of our Constitution and given five cases that we'd had on the text dealing with sexual orientation, there was just no scope for distinguishing between the rights of same-sex couples and the rights of heterosexual couples to enjoy all the benefits and accept all the responsibilities of marriage. But there are some cases where the way you tell the story is as important as the actual outcome. Uh, legal opinions are about outcomes. People want to know the answer. But they're also about journeys, about how you reason, about the points of reference. 
and they involve a dialogue not just with the parties before you, a dialogue with your fellow judges, a dialogue with the legal profession who are going to be hearing these matters in future, a dialogue with the media who are going to report, a dialogue with the public, a dialogue with law students who are going to be the lawyers of the future. And so you have to take responsibility for the way you tell the story. And I would say now looking back, the heart of the litigation in our country at that stage was whether to use the word marry. That's what it was about. And there are different ways of achieving equality. There's what's called the equality of the graveyard and equality of the vineyard. Equality of the graveyard is equalized down. Well, if same-sex couples can't marry, then nobody can marry. Can you imagine the outcry there would have been? And there were some people arguing very seriously, saying marriage is for the religious bodies. The state simply has a civil union open equally to everybody. And that's the way you get rid of the word marriage. And in terms of pure logic, it's got an enormous amount going for it. But sometimes logic is up there, and the meaning of concepts for the people are out there. And so that would have created what I call an equality of resentment. And it would have been the same-sex couple saying, just as we're getting there, they abolish state marriages, just as we're about to get there. And heterosexual couples were saying, these pesky people, they're not satisfied with not having it themselves. If they can't have it, no one can have it. It would have been a disastrous outcome, and that can't be what our Constitution is aiming to achieve, simply on the basis of formal identity of treatment to everybody. The other question was separate but equal. And the soft way out, the relatively soft way out, is through a civil union that doesn't use the word marry. The court didn't have to decide on that. We had a major strategic question which comes out because there was one dissent uh, from my colleague Kate O'Regan, who incidentally was educated in a Catholic convent. And she wanted a more radical position than the one that we adopted. She wanted the court itself to redefine the common law definition of marriage, which was taken from an English case based on Mormons. Uh, marriage is the union for life of one man and one woman. Part of our common law, and to say, is the union for life of two people. The court to do that. And she wanted the court itself to insert in the Marriage Act, IAB, take UCD to be my lawful husband stroke wife stroke spouse. Spouse is gender neutral. Ten of us felt that that was not the best way to go. I can only speak for myself now, not for my colleagues who signed on. A major argument used by opponents of same-sex marriages, the major argument was, this is something that affects the sentiments, the deeply held beliefs of millions of people. It's an issue that belongs to the legislature. It's not for a court to substitute its own sense of right and wrong for that of the legislature. In fact, the South African Law Reform Commission had been consulting with the public for a number of years, had come up with a draft that gave various options to Parliament, but that would end up permitting either the civil union in the form that I mentioned, equality of the graveyard, or changing the terms of the Marriage Act by adding the word or spouse. 
My feeling was that it's not only the courts that have a responsibility to uphold fundamental rights. The legislature is bound by the same constitution, by the same Bill of Rights. And we're dealing here with a law that's under-inclusive. There's nothing wrong with the Marriage Act. It's not a pernicious law. You don't want to strike down the marriage law. You want to extend its scope to include people who had been rendered invisible, who didn't count, for reasons that were unacceptable in our new constitutional order. So we decided to use the powers that we have, expressly given to us in terms of our constitution. It says, any court hearing, any court that decides that a law or state conduct is unconstitutional shall make a declaration to that effect. You don't have an option. You can't say, this is very awkward. Uh, come back next year. You've got to declare it once the case has been brought. And the court in doing so may suspend the declaration of invalidity for a specified period to give the legislature an opportunity to correct the defect. We do that quite often. It means you don't have too drastic practical consequences and you allow Parliament to redraft the law rather than strike down the whole law. You keep it going sometimes with an interim regime in the meanwhile. So our decision was to give Parliament one year to correct the defect. And then the question was to make it clear that separate but equal was not on. And in South Africa, it wasn't difficult to argue about how pernicious separate but equal was. Because that had been a rationale for apartheid over centuries. There was a case dealing with separate queues in a post office, one for whites and other for blacks. And the top court at the time said, what's the problem? You can get your stamps just as easily from the one line as from the other. Only one judge dissented. Uh, reading his biography, I heard afterwards he'd been a socialist, which was quite a strong word to use in the 1930s. And he said it was a question of human dignity. The reason for separating people is not based on convenience, it's based on marginalization, on exclusion. The toughest part of the decision for me now, I know the issues going to Parliament, Parliament will have a year to find out how to rectify the defect in the in the statute, and once the statute's changed, it automatically changes the common law. This would involve public hearings. I felt that was a good thing. Not to have, as it were, a constitutional court coup. We are the smart, clever, enlightened, progressive people, and we are telling society what's good for you to be advanced. A Bill of Rights is for the nation, it's for everybody. And if painful statements are made, and if homophobia is expressed, so be it, it's there. Let it come out into the open. Let the nation grapple with the issue. Let Parliament grapple with the issue. The very Parliament that had included sexual orientation in the Constitution in the first place was now called upon to follow through with the consequences that flowed from that. And so there was a parliamentary team, portfolio committee that traveled around. It was an enormous education for many of them. They'd never confronted these issues. And many homophobic statements, really hurtful statements were made. And some were counted and others weren't counted. Eventually it came back to Parliament. The ANC has a two-thirds majority in Parliament, so effectively it was an ANC decision. And I was told afterwards that at an ANC caucus when some people were bothered about it, worried about how it conflicted with their religious beliefs and so on, Terra Lakota, one of the 
leaders who'd been in prison for many years stood up and made a very passionate speech saying we were fighting for freedom for everybody. And there were gay and lesbian people who were in the struggle with us fighting for their freedom. And now we've got our freedom, can we say that they can't have their freedom? And the law was adopted with a huge majority. It's a strange law. It's called the Civil Union Act. But that was to allow people who didn't want to marry to get the benefits of a legal relationship, cohabitants, to have their domestic partnerships registered. It also allowed same-sex couples who didn't want to marry and subject themselves to heteronormativity to have a civil union. But it included a clause, and this was the vital clause, it included a clause that said, gave a choice to the partners to say, I marry you. The word marry, the M word, appeared in the statute. <coughs> the hardest part of the judgment for me was writing the very passages that Jeff read out. Because this was now writing for the Christian Lawyers for Africa and writing for the Gay Pride Marches. And you can't have half the judgment saying one thing and another half saying something else. There's an internal inconsistency. You end up pleasing nobody and it lacks the dignity and coherence and principle foundation that a judgment should have. I might say I was concerned, and I'm only speaking for myself, other colleagues could have had their own motivation. I was concerned at the effect of many decisions of the Supreme Court in the United States that end up dividing the nation bitterly. And the division gets congealed and strengthened. And so dealing with termination of pregnancy, which side are you on, this side or that side? And then people start killing people on the other side. And so instead of some kind of foundation in which people can live and coexist with different sentiments about what makes you a human being, about the meaning of existence in a, a shared global world in the way that I try to achieve. It's which side are you on? And are you, for me it would have been easy to say, we are the enlightened ones. We are progressive. We are not prejudiced. They are the bigots. They've got to move forward. They're reactionary. And then you divide the nation into the enlightened and the bigots using some kind of a, a cultural test. And I have no difficulty myself in associating myself with what I would call the results of the enlightenment and getting rid of prejudice and stereotypes and seeing why it is that many people uh, take on homophobic visions of the world. But I'm a judge up there, I'm speaking to everybody. And I would like to feel that the pronouncements of the court are pronouncements that will register with everybody. Everybody will feel understood and recognized and included in the overall vision that's being presented there. Even if they disagree with the eventual outcome. And one positive result of that and it involves taking religion seriously. I think I take religion seriously because as a 12-year-old child, I had to battle with that. It wasn't race that shaped me. My mother worked as a typist for Moses Katani, African leader. Tidy up, tidy up, Uncle Moses is coming. I grew up in that non-racial atmosphere early on. That wasn't. The tough thing for me was conscience. And 
conscience only means something if it's deep, if it's real, if it affects who you are and your honest relationship to existence, to your fellow human beings, to the world. And in that respect, I have an immense feeling of acknowledgement for the consciences of others. In some ways, not being a former believer, all religions are equally bizarre to me, so in some ways it's a little easier. There's no single one that has a particular attraction that would be drawing me in that becomes the model for comparing the others. But it is taking belief seriously. And I felt that should be conveyed in the, in the judgment. In fact, that part of the portion that you quoted was from the Christian Education Schools case, where the issue of Christian education cropped up very directly. And it was so important when we, in the end, on balance, balancing out all the factors, decided these Christian education schools couldn't get a religious exemption from the prohibition against deliver, delivering corporal punishment in the schools, simply on the grounds of their belief. Nevertheless, one had to take their beliefs very, very seriously and understand it was very meaningful for them. And what I find interestingly interesting on the court, I suspect that my colleagues who were deep Christians were far more dismissive of the Christian education schools than I was, because they felt this isn't real Christianity. And to me, and they never said that, but that couldn't be the issue. The South African Council of Churches debated what they should say to Parliament while the measure was being considered. And they came out with a statement saying that they thought this was a Solomonian judgment. Now my dad was Solly, Solly Sachs. So I was particularly pleased that it was called a Solomonian judgment. But in a way, that was exactly what I was aiming at. And so they took a sort of bland position. And there was relatively little uh, clerical opposition to the legislation. Quite strong, even strident from some quarters. But there wasn't an overwhelming public mobilization. How can this be? Who the hell do the judges think they are? Completely out of touch with the society. Eventually, a few days before the year was up, the new law was passed. The very first same-sex marriage happened to be between a game ranger and his hunky pal. <laughs> you know, if you want to invent a male couple, <laughs> who don't look like the caricature of the effeminate pansies. You couldn't have got more regular looking white South African guys than, than these two guys. <laughs> and it's becoming accepted in the society. Taking a bit longer to get the marriage offices organized in some centers than others. But it's happening. And about three weeks after the law came into force, uh, I was driving to botanical gardens uh, in Cape Town called Kirstenbosch. Any of you been to Kirstenbosch? Quite a few. Beautiful, beautiful gardens on the slopes of Table Mountain. The most bourgeois, family-oriented place you can imagine. And I'm not quite sure where to go. And I see a sign with an arrow to Amy and Jean's marriage. I felt fantastic. It was so simple. And Amy was American, is American, Jean South African. They got married in South Africa. And, uh, and Jean told me how they had booked the reception hall, the restaurant, and a week before she felt, 
I better phone and tell them. And she said she phoned and the manageress said, and she said, there are two women. She said, oh, how wonderful. You'll be the first and I'll be the first. That's great. <coughs> and then about a year ago, there was the marriage to end all marriage, marriages. Zach Schmidt, who had been a street child, leader of the Treatment Action Campaign case, uh, uh, campaign fighting for antiretrovirals, married his young lover from an Afrikaans rural family. And the press carried the story of the marriage and saying who were there, what people were wearing, the speeches. And the most moving part was to hear from the mother of the young Afrikaans guy commenting, I only wish my late husband was alive. We never got together like this in the old days. It's so wonderful to see my son so happy. Thank you. I need a pen, pen and paper, eh? Can you answer the debate? Some church leaders argue that all expressions. In the U.S. debate, some church leaders argue that by stopping them from forming marriages, the church should somehow be able to stop them from being married. Can you answer that question? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh
more? Come on, two more. <laughs> What do you stand up who can hear you? What's your opinion on the Don't Ask, Don't Tell legislation? Adam, will you pose the Two part, um, following up on your thing, I mean, our Constitution does not outlaw discrimination based on sexual orientation. So that's kind of a compare and contrast. And then one of the other legal arguments against is that um, a Supreme Court decision or federal decision allowing gay marriage would violate states' rights, legislating, you know, marriage law. So that's also a difference. And again, compare and contrast. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, and I'm going to drill. <laughs> Now, I'm going to deal globally with the questions about the situation in America. Uh, I wouldn't like it if an American judge came to South Africa and told us what the law should be and how th things should go. And uh, so I'm going to, to duck all of those questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, Now, that used to, I used to be able to say, well, I'm a sitting judge and I shouldn't do it. I'm not even a sitting judge anymore. Uh, I can't use that, that cover. But um, I don't think it would be appropriate. Uh, what I can say is I will follow with very, very great interest. Uh, in the end, text is important. That, that I can say. Uh, and certainly it was easier for us than it is for judges in other countries. But judges in other countries have come to the same conclusion. In Canada, they don't have text. And the Supreme Court, Parliament, to uh, accept same-sex marriages, but they almost obliged it in terms of a rather general, uh, general opinion. Uh, the Massachusetts Supreme Court didn't have the text. Uh, Margie Marshall and others, the majority, found the language there. And I think it's a certain deep values that are at stake and, and uh, the normative system that, that's really important uh, that's at stake. Uh, just in terms of no hope, uh, maybe after Bowers and Hardwick there was no hope. But uh, years later Lawrence comes along and it changed the scene uh, quite radically. And I, I, I'm astonished, this is now speaking as an outsider, not as a lawyer, how quickly, how quickly the process has moved in this country. Uh, I was stunned to, to think that pe people are even contemplating an appeal to the federal courts to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, it was unthinkable. A few years ago an election was fought in which um, the goodies were running for cover and the baddies on this particular issue were absolutely rampant and, and gaining votes and uh, it's remarkable how much things have changed. So I certainly wouldn't identify with a no-hope uh, kind of outlook. Um, what I would think about a little bit is something Ruth Bader Ginsburg said to me once about Roe v. Wade. Uh, she thinks maybe it was a mistake to get a Supreme Court decision, particularly one based on privacy. She would have preferred one based on equality that had a more powerful foundation, but also it stopped the campaigning in the states to get the legislators to come round. And what's been happening here now is people have been campaigning, mobilizing grassroots, getting support, getting legislators to make the judges feel a little less vulnerable, a little less out in the cold out there, a little less, too much ended language. In any event, it's been very fascinating for me to watch and I'll continue to be fascinated. Uh, we had a couple of churches in South Africa that did solemnize same-sex marriages. And theoretically, if the officials of those churches had been recognized as marriage officers, 
like the rabbi or a uh, Presbyterian church minister, they get designated as marriage officers. So you can be married in the synagogue or married in the Presbyterian church and you might sign two books the one is the religious one and one is the state one, but you don't have to go and re-register it again. So if the priests and the ministers in those particular churches had been designated, it wouldn't have been necessary even to change the marriage vow. But that would be very small a number of people and you'd have to be a member of that church. Uh, and I read a, a rather astonishing article by a writer, Mark Avissa, who himself eventually married. He married a guy, Chetty, and Chetty said, gold, I'm an Indian origin, I want gold. And um, uh, they eventually married more for practical reasons than anything else. But in the, in the pre free case days, he attended an African church where same-sex unions were celebrated. And he said, they were fantastic. The music, the dancing, the joy, everybody celebrated. And then he went to one in Pretoria, where people who had belonged to the Dutch Reformed Church, you know that American Gothic? <laughs> people like that. And he said they were all dressed in their sober suits. And that was their culture. They, they happened to be gay, but their culture was restrained and serious and, and solemn and rather dour. And they carried that through there. So technically the answer would be those churches could have done it, but they wouldn't have had the recognition as marriages if people came to a secular court to try and get a divorce or whatever. What the judgment does is emphasize very strongly that this decision and the uh, opening up of marriage on equal terms to same-sex partners in no way compelled religious bodies, faith communities, to go against their consciences and their tenets. And the Marriage Act expressly says that, and this was an interpretation of the Constitution, but it was saying you have to coexist with people who have a different worldview, and they have their rights as people, as human beings, under the Constitution, and your outlook can't be used to dictate what their rights should be. <coughs> the question about talking in South Africa to overcome problems of deep division we fight, we get cross with each other. And there are some fairly deep divisions. But in the end, we got our constitution through talking. Uh, we had armed struggle. We had quite a lot of pain. The gain didn't come cost-free. But in the end, we negotiated our revolution. America had a war of independence. Those who couldn't accept fled to Canada. The victors then negotiated amongst themselves to draft the Constitution. It was like we drafted our Constitution speaking to King George, who agreed not to be the king anymore, to be part of the new polity. So we got our Constitution through talking. We had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that dealt with the most painful episodes in our past. It was public talking. Those who'd suffered spoke out and their grief and pain was acknowledged and recognized. Those responsible also spoke out and they got the benefit of amnesty if they told the truth. It's very much in African cultural tradition. The Imbi, Lakhotla, where a good traditional leader would summon all the elders, well it would be patriarchal, but the elder men. Uh, and a good leader was a leader who got a consensus from everybody. 
So we have that deep cultural tradition that we can draw on. And we had a case dealing with participatory democracy where the, the, the uh, Constitution says the legislative bodies must take reasonable measures to involve the public in the drafting of legislation. And that was taken to, to mean the public can sit in the galleries and they can speak to the portfolio committees when the law is being passed. But our court took it further. It said there will be cases where you have public hearings. And there was a particular case where the upper house had promised public hearings in all the provinces and then at the last minute said, sorry, we're not going to have them because uh, we don't have time. We have to meet a deadline. The court struck down the laws that were passed on the basis that the upper house had decided it was reasonable to have these hearings and then unreasonably reneged. And we struck it down. It was very powerful. And we spoke about participatory democracy. That formal democracy, representative democracy, is vital. We fought for the vote. It's foundational. But it's not enough. You don't go to sleep. Democracy doesn't go to sleep, in our case, every five years, and get kissed into life when a new election is about to take place. So in that sense, uh, I would say the tradition of talking things through, looking into each other's eyes, is strong in our country. I don't believe we're unique. And one hears talk about bipartisanship in the legislature here. People would like it. Many people would like it. Some people don't. The political game plays itself out in its own way. I think every society can benefit from that. And it's looking into the eyes of the other, imagining you're in the position of the other. It can only be healthy for, for any society. The Uganda case is, is very painful. The only good thing about it is it's come out into the open, it's provoking intense discussion and debate. And sometimes the worst thing is when the issue is denied completely. Often though when it comes to homosexual rights, sometimes a don't ask, don't talk in a rather homophobic society is an advance on uh, root it out and persecute. Uh, I think what happened there, there is some religious bodies got in on the act and um, made it into a big issue and then some politicians felt this is a good bandwagon to, to jump on. Uh, it wasn't proposed that the death penalty be used for homosexual conduct as such. A woman leader, there are all sorts of uh, anthropological reasons for that. But same-sex erotic relationships have been known in Africa and spoken about uh, all over the continent for a long time, and it's coming out now. And studies have shown, for example, many of the strongest women in South Africa, the uh, Kurandeiros, the Inyangas, the, the um, double, double toil and trouble, uh, the, the traditional healers, many of them have wives, and fairly openly. Uh, and people are trying to explore the reasons for that and, and, and so on. So this idea that Africa is uh, somehow anciently and intrinsically uh, homophobic uh, is being dispelled. And I don't think it's uh, honestly as a continent more homophobic than the United States has been. And the United States is changing, and changing rapidly and dramatically, almost, almost as we're speaking, astonishingly. Uh, but 20, 30 years ago, I, I don't think one would have distinguished between Africa and the United States, or most of Europe, uh, for that matter. I've got one thing here I can't read, it just says sex. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> it was after Uganda. <laughs> Who asked? You asked about that? Yeah, well, I asked about the fact that you wrote into the Constitution. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sexual orientation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boring, boring. <laughs> Are you in favor or against? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, the, um, somebody from Chicago, Jennifer Spruill, I think her name is, did a doctorate on the sexual orientation clause in the South African Constitution. And um, it is quite interesting seeing its origin. As far as I know, I think there's one state in Brazil that's got, uh, it's the only constitutional text that actually includes sexual orientation. I might be wrong. Not, not statutes that forbid discrimination, but in the fundamental law. And the origin actually was a meeting of the women's section of the ANC in Lusaka, starting off when we were still in exile, just the time when Mandela was released. And the, it was, the women's section had uh, power to mandate the organization on certain issues. And they took decisions on outlook towards marriage. And the decision was, we're not against marriage. Uh, African people have had their marriages destroyed by apartheid. And most of us are fighting for the right to marry and to have marriages. But the real issue is the relationships within marriage. And that's what we want, equality within marriage, and if marriage breaks down, equality afterwards. That was a binding decision of the conference. Another decision was to have no discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation. So this was a properly mandated conference of the women's section of the ANC adopting that. That meant that those of us who were on the constitutional committee of the ANC, it wasn't what Carter thinks, or what Albie thinks, or what X or Y would have to think. There was that decision. And the question is, then was, should it go into the ANC Draft Bill of Rights? And fairly early on, it did go in. And so now, here was the organization that ended up getting two-thirds of the vote, putting it into its Draft Bill of Rights. I remember on one speaking tour, to explain the Bill of Rights, speaking at University of Fort Hare in the Eastern Cape to a very rural audience, not just students, uh, there were two issues I felt I ought to highlight because I knew they would be contentious. The one was abolishing the death penalty. The other was no discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation. I felt we mustn't come along, win the vote, and people feel we've smuggled in these issues. They must understand. And if they accept it reluctantly, but they trust the leaders, if the leaders want it, we'll go along with it, so be it. But they must know what they're accepting. And they accepted. And as we walked out, one young guy walked with me. He said, I just want to understand this sexual orientation thing. I mean if two men love each other, uh, that will be accepted. And I'm beginning to get a bit defensive, you know, to start my counter-argument uh, to what I think he's going to say. And I said, yes. He said, no, no, I just wanted to know. I just wanted to understand it, and, and he walked off. That was the only comment I got. Then when it came to the interim constitution, uh, I wasn't on the section that worked on drafting the bill. So I wasn't an original intender for that particular section. But in the ANC we did discuss, and we insisted on putting it in. And the arguments against it, you know, were so, so rubbishy. <laughs> Sexual orientation that means like goats. 
<laughs> you know, is that all right? If you like abusing young children, is that all right? Everybody knew it had nothing to do with that. Uh, the same would apply to heterosexual, you know, if you... Uh, it doesn't mean it's only same-sex coach that you can't uh, <laughs> have, have dealings with. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and it was pushed through uh, by the negotiators. Just... No, I think I'll just leave it at that. I can't... <laughs> I can't reveal too much history because uh, I was responsible for the, for the decision in the end. But, but the fact is that the court first had to deal with decriminalizing sodomy. And I think it was a strategic decision on the part of the coalition. That was the easiest to outlaw. Mm -hmm. Sexual orientation, basis for sending people to jail. And we struck it down. And that was a common law offence. It wasn't even a statute. And we declared the common law to be unconstitutional. Um, then we had the rights of same-sex partners to benefit in the way that spouses benefited under the immigration laws. That your wife or husband doesn't have to go out of the country to get a resident permit and doesn't have to get a special work permit can work like South Africans. And the court said in the Home Affairs case, this is unfair discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation. And we had to give a definition of uh, same-sex life partnerships to be the equivalent. We had a case where uh, Judge Justice Cathy Satchwell said that her pension scheme didn't enable her to recognize her partner as equivalent to her spouse. That was unfair discrimination, and the court accepted that. Another judge, uh, DeVos, had adopted two children, and she was living in a les lesbian relationship, uh, and her lesbian partner said, I want to have equal rights as a parent. And in fact, while Ms. Ms. DeFoss is going to court, I'm the one spending more time with the children. And there are lots of practical reasons. Sometimes permission has to be given for emergency medical treatment and all the rest. And it's in the interest of the rights of the child to have both parents sharing equal responsibility and, and, and authority. And we accepted that. We had a case where I was on leave at the time, but it dealt with uh, fertilizing uh, of, of the ovum. And there was something in the statutes that had a, a, an exclusive character, and we struck that down. In the Home Affairs case, we said, but we're not dealing with marriage expressly. We're only dealing with these situations. We expressly left it open. But by then, the court had incrementally moved forward and reached the stage where this was now the logical culmination of a process that had already been well established. I want to thank Justice Sachs for five wonderful lectures. And on behalf of Michael Geyer, my uh, faculty director of the Human Rights Program, and Richard Posen, our benefactors, the rest of the staff and students, we invite you all to a reception now following this lecture, um, not as a send-off for Justice Sachs, but because we hope he will come back again. <laughs> so we want to show him our appreciation and our appreciation of you for making this a really lively, dialogue and discussion among people who deeply care about human rights and justice, and with a phenomenal teacher in the person of Justice Elvis Sachs. <laughs>